gave up the riches of heaven to walk as a man here on this earth, and he became sickness and poverty and spiritual death upon the cross. Amen? So that we don't have to walk in those things. Now, uh, if that's highly offensive uh, to anybody in here, you need to get glad in the same pants you got mad in. Because it's the Word of God. Amen? So we're going to talk about blessings a little bit today. Um, if, you, if you talk about any kind of uh, physical or material blessings, then they claim that you're a poverty, that you're a prosperity teacher. And I always tell them I tried preaching poverty, but nobody would come. And, but the reality of it is God is a loving Father, and He wants the same thing for us that we want for our children. I don't know of anybody in this room that's really hoping and praying that their children can be poor, broke, busted, disgusted, and sick. And we would never call poor, broke, busted, and disgusted, and sick as a blessing, would we? And yet we have people that get sick and have terrible things and tragedies hit, and I'll hear them actually say, well, I don't know what it is that God's trying to teach me, but he's a good God. He's trying to teach. Quit blaming God for things that are happening in this world that's a fallen world. Amen? And uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of go about this in a different way this morning. But what were the blessings, if, if, you were, if you were an Israelite, what were the blessings that God promised if you were to obey everything that God said? In Deuteronomy 28, this is in the message version. Uh, it said in De Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 6, it said, If you listen obediently to the voice of God your God and heartily obey all his commandments that I command you today, God your God will place on you high, high above all the nations of the world. All these blessings will come down on you and spread out beyond you because you have responded to the voice of God your God. God's blessing inside the city, God's blessing in the country, God's blessing on your children, the crops of your land, the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds, the lambs of your flocks, God's blessing on your basket and bread bowl, God's blessing in your coming in, God's blessing in your going out. God will defeat your enemies who attack you. They'll come at you on one road and run away on seven roads. God will order a blessing on your barns and workplaces. He'll bless you in the land your God, your God is giving you. God will form you as a people holy to him, just as he promised you. If you keep the commandments of God, your God, and live the way he has shown you, all the peoples on earth will see you living under the name of God and hold you in respectful awe. God will lavish you with good things, children from your womb, offspring from your animals, crops from your land, the land that God promised your ancestors that he would give you. God will throw open the doors of the sky vaults and pour rain on your land and schedule and bless the work you take in your hand. You will lend to many nations, but you yourself won't have, a, have to take out a loan. How good would that be? God will make you the head and not the tail. You'll always be the top dog, never the bottom dog. As you obediently listen to and diligently keep the commandments of God, your God, that I'm commanding you today. Don't swerve an inch to the right or left from the words that I command you today by going off and following and worshiping other gods. You know what the problem with all those? All those blessings of obedience? We suck at being obedient. The, the Bible says over in Romans, the third chapter, that the law was given to those under the law, talking about Israel. But it also came with this right here. It said that, it, it, it told us that it might pronounce the whole world guilty before God. The purpose of the law, when he talks about the law, he's not talking about all the little ordinances. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. We know that because when Paul wrote the church at Corinth, he said the law that was written on stone. What was written on stone? The Ten Commandments. And so you can really replace when it says the law most of the time in the Word of God, you can replace it by saying the Ten Commandments. That's what he's talking about. But man doesn't do well at commandments. How many people know that? I mean, be honest. You don't do well at commandments. The, the Mexican restaurant will sh set down a plate and say, don't touch it's hot. What's the first thing you do? You touch it. A sign says, wait, wet paint, don't touch. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what it is. You give us a command, 
and immediately, as a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle said it like this. He said that, that the commandments came and produced sin in Paul. In the seventh chapter of the book of Romans. Why? Well, he said not because the commandments weren't holy, but because he wasn't holy. So we needed a God that could find a way that could impart to us the perfect right standing with God. So God did that. And I love the way that God did that because not only did God send his son to die upon the cross and pay the penalty for all of our misbehaving, but he also sent his son who walked absolutely obediently without sin. So he's an example of walking a perfect life and he is the blood sacrifice for all the sins that we've committed. Now the problem with religion is, and I see Teresa back there, I'm waving at her because she's here and and at any rate, uh, I, I'll embarrass you for a moment. Debbie said that she doesn't want me to go to that rally. And, and I said, well, Teresa will be going. She can't, can't go with a girl by herself. I said, there'll be other people going to the rally, to the BMW rally. Am I wandering away from the sermon? <laughs> Am I just talking to people again? I said, oh, okay. <laughs> So anyway, I want to tell you, here's, here's the beautiful thing about this, is that when Jesus came uh, and he said, it is finished, he really meant it was finished. And yet religion doesn't teach you that you're a finished product. Even though it says in Colossians, the third chapter, and ye are complete in him, who feels complete? We don't feel complete, but we are. As far as God is concerned, we are we are completed in the spirit realm. We are, our spirits are complete. But man fails miserably at following, uh, following commandments. There were blessings to obedience. So what would happen? Well, man would walk in that for a little while. He'd do pretty good at, at trying to follow the commandments. And, and yet, what would happen? He'd fail. Now he's no longer operating in the blessings because he has failed. Now the only way to take care of that is according, the Bible says there can be no remission of sins without their shedding of blood. So God came out with a sacrificial system so they could shed blood to take care of the sins that they would commit. And it was all a picture of Christ. But man fails miserably at obeying God's law. But Jesus obeyed perfectly and then still paid the penalty for our disobedience. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, we read you some verses. This is in the Amplified Bible. Uh, the ninth chapter starting in, in the 11th verse. And I'm going to give you a lot of scriptures today. Just memorize them and we'll test afterwards. But that appointed time came when Christ the Messiah appeared as a high priest of the better things that have come and are to come. Then through the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with human hands, that is not a part of this material creation, he went once for all into the holy of holies of heaven, not by virtue of the blood of goats and calves by which to make reconciliation between God and man, but his own blood, having found and secured, I want you to look at this, having found and secured a complete redemption and everlasting release for us. Well, a release from what? I don't think most Christians know what they were released from. We were released from our sins, first and foremost. We were also released from the law. I've been released from the law. Nobody was ever made righteous by the law. Why was that? Well, because all it, uh, the sole purpose of the law was to pronounce us guilty before God. Amen? And so we were released from the law and released from the penalty of sin and released from the power that Satan had over us. We ought to be living a free life. And we would if we weren't so covered up with religion. Religion's terrible. Religion takes the simple plan of salvation and, and, and tells you that that which was offered free to you is something that you have to work for and earn. And for you to live the type of life that you ought to be living, was there, he that the Son has set free is free indeed. To live a free life, you need to come to the place where you're trusting in the finished work of Christ and not trusting in your own ability. 
Then he goes on to say, For if the mere sprinkling of unholy and defiled persons with blood of goats and bulls with the ashes of a burnt heifer is sufficient for the purification of the body, how much surely shall the blood of Christ, who by virtue of his eternal spirit, his own preexistent divine personality, has offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice to God, purify our consciousness from dead works and lifeless observances to serve the ever-living God. Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator and mediator of an entirely new agreement, testament and covenant, so that those who are called and offered it may receive the fulfillment of the promised everlasting inheritance. Somebody say everlasting. Since a death has taken place which rescues and delivers and redeems them from the transgressions committed under the old first agreement. So under the old covenant, under the old covenant, uh, sin and disobedience had violated the old covenant. But we were set free and released from that. I'm not living under the old covenant. I'm living under the new covenant. I ought to be living a free life. Amen. We have much to rejoice over, folks. I want to tell you this morning, the main thrust of what I want you to get by the time we get done is that you have been blessed by God and nobody can take that blessing. Hallelujah. Nobody can bring a curse upon that which God has already blessed. Amen. Romans 3.27 uh, lets us know something because after what Christ has done, in Romans 3.27 in the New Living Translation says it like this, Can we boast then that we've done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal, say acquittal, our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it's based on faith. The real key to this thing is are we operating in faith? Are we believing God? Romans 10, 2 through 4, is that I love these scriptures because he's deal primarily said he wanted to pray for Israel. But I love what he's saying here. He says, I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it's misdirected zeal. For they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. For Christ already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. That ought to make you happy. You know how I know that people don't believe that? Because they're constantly finding things that are wrong with themselves. And I hear it all the time. Well, I'd do better if I could just do this. Or if I could just do that. If I could read my Bible more, pray more. Serve more, tithe more, do this, do that, do that. What you're actually saying is that you're not complete. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this, because I believe in giving and I believe in working in the church. I believe in tithing. I believe in all that kind of stuff. But can I tell you this? If I never gave another dime, I'd still be perfect in God's sight because of what Jesus did. I've been clean and sober for 36 years, but if I get snot slinging drunk and fall out of my face right here, pass out I will not have lost the favor of God because I have God's favor because of what Jesus did not because of what I do and it isn't until you get to the place where you're locked into understanding the perfect thing that God did for us that you'll really serve him I want to serve him I love him he set me free it makes me want to serve him and I used to get these guys that were, were, were old, hardline Pentecostals would try to talk me out of it. One of them invited me to his church one day. I thought he was going to have coffee and a donut, but he spent three hours trying to convince me that what I preach is heresy. But he wasn't ready for the fact that I do know my Bible. So trying to say something, I'd give him another scripture, you know. But the point is, is this right here. He did all that. It was so upsetting to him that I knew right where I was going and was totally secure in my relationship with Christ. He said, you telling me you don't doubt your salvation? Of course not. Amen. Well, how could, he said, everybody doubts their salvation. No, not everybody, because I just told you, I don't. <coughs> Amen? Because my trust is not in what Bob Capps can do, but my trust is in what Jesus has already done. Amen? But listen, 
All who believe in him are made right with God. Not everybody who believes that Jesus existed, that's not what it be believing in him is all about. It's about understanding what Christ did and moving from a life of unbelief into a life of belief. Did you know God always wanted to bless man from the very beginning? How long has God's blessing been available? Since the very beginning. God blessed Adam in the garden. In the beginning, Adam was standing in the center of God's perfect will for mankind. God had created Adam and Eve and created a garden and gave them a job to do to take care of the garden. But more than that, he blessed them and told them that they were to be fruitful and multiply. And that beautiful garden experience was something that they were supposed to take all over the world. And had Satan come not, uh, had not come and deceived Adam, can I tell you this? There wouldn't have been a Bible that went past Genesis 2. Because man would have just done what God, man was supposed to do, and this world would be in a perfect place. Amen? Adam was in absolute unity and fabulous fellowship. He was surrounded by God's goodness and, and plentiful provision, everything that he wanted. He had a worldwide vision and the power to carry out that vision. He's commissioned to build God's family, expand the Garden of Eden to fill the earth. And it really, because God wanted to dwell with man as a family, but life uh, couldn't get any better than that except for Adam acted like an idiot. See, God had already saw everything that he made, everything he made was good. God didn't make something and go, that was pretty good. I always think about that. Uh, what, you, you ever see a platypus? I don't know if God sneezed during creation <laughs> and created the platypus. But anyway, whatever, he saw whatever he made was good. Evening and morning were the sixth day, and the heavens and the earth were finished, and all of the host of them on the seventh day ended his work. God ended his work which he'd made. God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because he had rested from all his work which God created and made. And the blessing had been released on Adam. And God retired. People always think that what God has to do, now listen to me, but people believe that God is busy working every day right now. From what? Doing what? He's done. Everyone say that. God's done. And he gave this planet to mankind. Mankind turned his authority that God had given him over to Satan when he rebelled against God. There's nothing more for God to do. He planned to move his heavenly headquarters to earth and make it his home. And yet, he left this blessing with man. And all man had to do was walk in that blessing. Amen? And I get tired of people bla blaming Eve. I understand it's easy to blame women. But anyway, uh, no, I'm just teasing. But God hasn't changed his mind about blessing mankind. He hasn't altered his plan. He's given his word and his family is blessed and he's resting, assured that the power of that blessing will bring the word to pass in spite of everything hell tries to do. But Adam messed things up. In Romans 5, 17 in the Amplified Bible, it said, For if because of one man's trespass, talking about Adam, if, for if because of one man's trespass, lapse, offense, death reigned through that one, much more surely... Will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness. Everyone say free gift. free gift. Putting them into right standing with himself. Now it's going to tell us how we ought to be living. They'll reign as kings in life. What is God's will for us? To reign as kings in life through the one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. And then the 21st verse says, So that just as sin has reigned in death, so grace, his un, uh, unearned and undeserved favor, might reign also through righteousness, right standing with God, which issues in eternal life through Jesus Christ, Messiah, the anointed one, our Lord. Had it not been for the devil and man's cooperation with him, the Bible would have been a very short book. But God's plan kicked into play. 
Genesis 3, 1 through 7 in the New Living Translation. It says, the serpent was a... Sh- I'm giving you a lot of scriptures, I know. Just memorize them all, you'll be fine. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden? Hey, already he's not saying what God said, is he? Now, understand this, that he spoke to the woman, but Adam was there with the woman. God had given instruction to Adam. Did God really say you must not eat of the fruit of any of the trees of the garden? She said, of course we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. The woman replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat or even touch it. If you do, you will die. So what did the serpent say? You won't die. Isn't that, what, isn't that how Satan still operates? You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it, and you'll be like God, knowing both good and evil. I had somebody ask me one time, do you think there was a difference in that fruit? I said, who cares? All the fruit in all the garden might have been exactly the same, but when they had been commanded not to eat of the tree in the middle of the garden, and they had done nothing but good until that time, The minute they took from the tree that they were forbidden from, they'd know good and evil, wouldn't they? The woman was convinced. She saw the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave it to her husband, who was whooped, who was with her. (laughs) Oh, it does. uh, Who was with her, and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were open, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. What was the devil's real plan in here? Was it about eating fruit? No. He wanted to come against the blessing that God had given for mankind to move forward, span the garden. He wanted to stop God's plan, and he still works on doing that today. He wants to stop the plan. He wants to stop the plan that God has for man. He wants to stop your part of the plan that God has called you to. I'm not surprised. He's still working. The devil is. But, but what did God do to deal with restoring man to his place? It's all found in one scripture, Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded, talking about Jesus, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. I love that. You know why? I'm, I, I, I've had people say, boy, why did Adam have to do that? Yeah, well, don't feel so high and mighty if Adam hadn't done it. When it got down to you, you'd have probably done it. So, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we're healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of it all. This idea of blessing, I don't want you to think it's something that's new. And people think, well, I'm blessed now that Jesus went to the cross. But the truth about it is, as I said before, the blessing went forward to Adam and Eve in the garden. And it was reconfirmed uh, with with Abraham. Jesus blessed Abraham. In Hebrews 6, 13, it says, for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. I think this is new living, but for example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name saying, I will certainly bless you. I'll multiply your descendants beyond number. Then Abraham waited patiently, and he received what God had promised. Now when, God, when t- people take an oath, they call on someone greater than themselves to hold them to it. Without any question, that oath is binding. God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. So there was a blessing went forth, and what did we just learn here? He never changed his mind. Say that. God never changed his mind. So God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is strong and trustworthy. It's an anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Galatians 3, in the New Living Translation. 
Galatians 3, 16 through 29. I'm really trying to get this down into you. I want you to understand that. If you came here and you're visiting here this morning, you're probably thinking, man, that guy uses a lot of Scripture. I want to tell you normally, though, normally I use a lot of Scripture. So, <laughs> Galatians 3, 16 through 29, the New Living Translation. God gave the promises to Abraham. We just heard those promises, didn't we? God gave the promises to Abraham and, and his child. Notice that the Scripture doesn't say to his children as if meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. Now, this is what I'm trying to say. This agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 438, 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. God made a promise to bless. He told Abraham that. It was just a continuation of what he'd already said in the garden. God's desire is to bless man. Amen? And here's what I want you to see about that group of scriptures right there. He's telling you that when he cut covenant with Abraham, he was actually cutting it with Abraham's seed. And in the King James it said he didn't say seeds that were many. He said seed, which is Christ. So that means that we are part of a covenant of blessing that's between God the Father and God the Son. Two parties that cannot fail. Do you think you can trust in that covenant? Just say that. God the Father, God the Son, made covenant with each other. I'm part of that covenant, and I have to be blessed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So I talked about what the devil did earlier, and what he does today is he does this right here. He tries to convince you because it is a free gift of righteousness and a right standing with God. He does his best to convince you that you've done something to keep you from being blessed. He'll work very hard on telling you that you're just not doing things right or things would be going better. Rather than you just confessing, I am the blessed of the Lord. I'm part of a covenant that cannot be broken. I am the blessed of the Lord. I live a life that's in expectation of God's blessings and his best all the time. Amen? That ought to be our conversation. That ought to be what we believe. That's what we need to be speaking to one, in, to one another all the time. When I went to the hospital for open heart surgery, Debbie did a really good job. She, she made sure people know, you're not going to go in and see my husband unless you're going to go in and talk blessing and healing to him because he don't want anybody coming in there crying and moaning, which is true. I don't want that. I'd rather have somebody come in, one of my buddies come in and say, get your butt out of that bed <laughs> than have him crying and moaning over me. I even went to a ministerial alliance meeting, and I know they met well, but a couple of them had heard about some problems I had in my kidneys, and, and one of the first things said, oh, how are you doing? I, I'm doing great. Yeah, <laughs> well, I, I heard the news. Well, I'm not dead. <laughs> we haven't planned a funeral here or anything, you know. And... Uh, but they were good when they, when they saw my attitude, what it was. They said, hey, you want us to pray for healing? Absolutely. Amen. He says in the 18th verse, For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Why then was the law given? He's done a lot to set the premise here that you're not made right by the law. But then that natural question comes up, well, then why do we have the law? Why do we have the Ten Commandments? If the Ten Commandments, it looks like they've been done away with, so why do we have it? And he answers this so well. Why then was the law given? It was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. 
But the law was designed to last only till the coming of the child who was promised. God gave his law through angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave the promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we'd be made right with God by obeying it. But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin and we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were kept under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way, and I love how Paul says this. But the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now the way of faith has come. We no longer need the law as our guardian. Say that I no longer need the law as my guardian. He goes on and said, For all you children of God through faith in Christ Jesus and, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. Well, if you're the children of Abraham, then his promise is your promise, isn't it? You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. And let me tell you something. God's blessing cannot be taken from you. Cannot be taken. Say that. God's blessing on my life cannot be taken from me. Numbers 23, 8 tells a great story right there, but Numbers 3, 28 says, How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? And how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defiled? Balak was trying to get Balaam, who was a sorcerer, to pronounce curses on Israel, but every time he went forward to do it, he couldn't do it because God had already blessed Israel. Amen? You know what? The devil can't. I hear people say, well, what about curses? I don't know nothing about curses. They can't be on my life. Say that. Curses can't come to my life because I'm the blessed of the Lord. Amen. I can remember times that, w that uh, we have dealt with people that are uh, just involved in witchcraft and things like that. And, uh, and I've had people say, aren't you afraid of them putting a curse on you? No, there's no room for curses in my life. I'm the blessed of the Lord. Well, you're bragging. I'm bragging on God. Let me tell you something. The blessing of God is an invisible force designed by God to bring us into victory and favor in every area of our life. Are you glad you came this morning? Wherever God's presence was in the Old Testament, there was great blessing there. And we have God's presence in us. Do you remember the story of Obed-Edom? And I love that story because when they were moving the ark, Uzzah had touched it, and because he touched it in ways he shouldn't have touched it, he immediately lost his life. Well, they took the ark and they placed it in the house of Obed-Edom. And the Bible says that Obed-Edom's house was blessed, and he was prosperous. The Lord blessed his household and everything he owned because the presence of God represented by the ark was in his house. Amen? Uh, uh, and so he went on to do great things. When it was time to move the ark, he decided that he loved the presence so, so, of God so much, he was going to move with it. Amen? We need to be more like Obed-Edom. We want to be where God's presence is. Have a desire for God. Keep your heart pure before God. You know, uh, meditate on the things of the Lord. Second Samuel six twelve says, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark or the presence of God. When you get born again, you have the presence of God. Amen? Therefore, no one and nothing can stop God's blessing in your life. Now, even though no one, as it says in Numbers 23, 20, no one can curse what God has blessed. Even though we know that that's true, the blessing is yours. But everything we have in God, we don't give by works. It's already ours. But we, re we receive it by faith, by believing God. 
By believing. Amen? By faith. The story of Esau and Jacob, I'm going to close with this. The story of Esau and Japheth, Jacob. Esau was a, a hunter. He was a rough man. He was what some people call a man's man, you know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, was rough looking and, and, and just a rough guy all the way around. Now, Jacob was kind of a mama's boy, but he was very in tune with what God said. And so, and so here Jacob had made some uh, lentil stew, and here comes Esau. He was real hungry, and he, and he comes in, and Jacob, and he goes, man, give me some of that stew, that red stew. He called it red stew. And, and uh, Jacob said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some of this stew if you, if you swear that you'll give me your birthright. Because Esau was the firstborn, which meant he would be the high priest of the house and everything else, you know. Great blessings with that. And Esau said, what do I care about being the, the firstborn? What do I care about that blessing? Who cares about that? I'm hungry. I don't need it if I starve to death, so give me something to eat. So he agreed to give away his birthright for some food. Now, here's the thing that people miss. They say, man, he gave up, he gave up his birthright for stew. Well, it looks like that. But what we don't understand about it is it was a very spiritual position as well. And so the truth about what he was really saying is that he gave up because of his hunger, because of his flesh, he gave up the mighty presence of God and chose over spiritual things he chose to feed his flesh. And that's where Christians get in trouble today. They still get in this trouble because we are fleshly creatures and we're spiritual creatures. Amen? And uh, uh, in Galatians 5.17, it says, For the flesh, in the New International Version, for the I like this version best, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. Here's some instruction. Don't do whatever you want. Because sometimes you want some things aren't good for you. They're not spiritual at all. And because of very unspiritual things, because your flesh desires something, even though the blessing is already yours, you choose not to walk in the blessing and you choose to do what the flesh wants rather than what God wants you to do. Amen? What we need to do is lay hold of that blessing, that design, that, 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 that favor that God has put on our life. You are very special in God's eyes. And we have the blessing of God in every area of our life if we'll walk in it. 2 Corinthians 5, 19 through 20 in the Amplified Bible says it was God personally present in Christ reconciling, restoring the world of favor with himself, not counting up and holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them. Understand that's what God did for you. So you can quit trying to find out reasons why you can't walk in God's blessing because all those things that you've done wrong, they were canceled 2,000 years ago. Are you glad about that? And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation and restoration of favor. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We as Christ's personal representative beg you to, for his sake. Lay hold of the divine favor now offered you. Be reconciled. Lay hold of God's favor. Lay hold of God's blessing. It's yours. Believe it. Confess it. Expect it. You are the blessed of the Lord. Do you receive that from the pastor this morning?